Good evening. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Speaking of Nebraska. Governor Pete Ricketts is back to join us and to answer your questions in our studio for this live town hall, along with Dr. Jasmine Marcellin of the UNMC, uh, an infectious disease specialist, and also Steve Wellman, Director of Nebraska Department of Agriculture, who also farms near Syracuse, New York. So, uh, <laughs> Not New York. I'm sorry, Syracuse, Nebraska. <laughs> That'd be a long commute. It would be a long commute. <laughs> well, you can join us tonight in the conversation, 800-676-5446 or 402-472-1212. You can also email us at news at netnebraska.org. Well, the number of COVID-19 cases in Nebraska has more than doubled in the last week. Nearly 500 cases were confirmed just today. Now at least 4,200 Nebraskans have been infected and 70 have died. But certain parts of the state have been hit much harder by the virus. There are eight counties in the state where at least 10 percent of the workforce is employed in animal slaughtering and processing. In those eight counties, the average rate of COVID-19 cases per 10,000 residents is 127. But the statewide average is just 20 cases per 10,000 residents. This week, President Trump ordered meatpacking plants to stay open. But these infection rates are alarming. So, Governor Ricketts, first question to you, is the state doing enough to respond to these hot spots? We are working very hard in these communities to be able to make sure that we're protecting the, the health and safety of the workers and keep the operations open because, of course, these are very important to our food supply chain. So we've taken a number of steps with the meat processors over the course of the last several weeks. Actually, I have weekly phone calls with all the food processors here in our state. Uh, UNMC has been out visiting. They've done site visits. I think they're up to 11 of the uh, facilities uh, so far where they go in in a non-regulatory way and say, hey, here's how you can improve things. I know the processors are taking steps to be able to do more social distancing in what is admittedly a very difficult environment to do social distancing. But they're putting up, for example, plexiglass, wall, plexiglass walls between workstations, uh, separating people in lunchrooms with plastic, you know, kind of creating your own phone booth to be able to do that testing people coming in, their temperatures, uh, making sure that they're sanitizing um, surfaces frequently, everybody's wearing masks, uh, also making sure that people who are sick go home and that they're uh, either getting paid or they're on uh, short-term disability and that sort of thing. So a number of steps working with the processors themselves to be able to address that. And then we also need to work on the two-thirds of the time that people aren't in the facility. Uh, a lot of times the communities that are working in these plants are um, English is not their first language, so we've got a communication barrier we've got to overcome, and that's why I've been doing press briefings in Spanish on Tuesdays and Thursdays to be able to help get the message out there. We're doing our translating our our pressing our press briefs into Spanish. We're doing our our whole thing. We're doing social media that way, and we're reaching out to local community leaders. So not just our local public health departments, but also trying to get uh, people at our you know, community health clinics and those local leaders to be able to help us get the message out with regard to social distancing, and then also help us with uh, testing and contact tracing so that we can really get a handle on who's been infected, get those people to isolate. Uh, we're working on, for example, uh, space for people, say, Grand Island, to be able to go isolate in because a lot of times you've got an, a lot of people in a household, multiple generations, and it's even difficult to socially isolate in those households. So we need to have opportunities for people to be able to move out to kind of isolate. So there's a lot of different things that we have to do to be able to address the issues because it's so difficult to socially distance in the plant and at home. And so we've got to take a number of steps to be able to address that. Director Wellman, as Governor Ricketts has said, these plants are a vital part of the food supply chain. Uh, Ronald in Grand Island asked us, with hundreds of production plants throughout the nation, how will shutting down three packing plants in the hot zones of, say, Grand Island, Lexington, and Dakota City for a short period of time cause a problem in the food supply chain nationwide? So talk about that chain and, and how these plants play into it. Sure, so in Nebraska, we're very blessed with a lot of production of livestock. And, and with that livestock, we do have the processors here in state. So uh, compared us to other states, we, we process more beef than any other state in the United States. We're number two in all red meat production. So those plants are very vital to, to moving the products that the farmers and ranchers raise here. Now, of course, we're very concerned about the workers in there for their health and their safety, and that's where it all begins, uh, the health and safety of the workers. But when it, it's, it's a very fine-tuned system, 
because uh, obviously in the beef, it, it's 16 months or so to marketplace. It's, it's nine months prior to that for the pregnancy. And, and so it's, it's a long-term planning to get the product from the farm to the processor and then eventually to the consumer after that. So as we, as the governor mentioned, these phone calls that we have with the, produce, with the processors, we are also having weekly phone calls with our farm organizations throughout Nebraska. Uh, the commodity organizations, the, the general farm organizations, we're listening to them because they're very much in touch with the producers throughout the state, hearing from them, and they're a great resource for, uh, for our farmers and ranchers and for us in the Department of Agriculture as we, we work to, uh, to help as, in any way we can to, to keep the, the workers safe, keep the uh, animals uh, productive and cared for, but also uh, keep uh, food flowing through the system all the way to the consumer. Yeah, if I could piggyback on that just a little bit as well. So you can't take Nebraska just in isolation. And as Steve said, we're a major producer, but these facilities exist in a lot of other states. And the same sorts of issues that we're working through here in Nebraska are the same ones they're working through in places like Pennsylvania and Colorado and Wisconsin and Iowa and South Dakota and Kansas. And so you can say, well, is it okay if this one shuts down? And in a normal situation, if that happened, as we had happen with a fire in Holcomb, Kansas, in a meat processing plant <clears throat> last year, it'll create, even that one plant created a lot of disruption and caused cattle prices to drop. So if you start having this happen all across the country, that's when you're really endangering that food supply chain because it's not just going to be Nebraska. These issues are going on in those other states as well. And, and it's not just about, uh, you know, even if you keep an operation right now, in many cases they're less capacity than would normally operate, so they're already slowing down. And then if, you, if they start shutting down all over the country, it's not just going to be in one place. It could be in the entire country. And that's when you have that massive disruption to our food supply chain. And people would go to the grocery store and go to the, the meat case and not find anything in it. So that's what, we're, we gotta, that's what we're trying to do is make sure that we're, again, as Steve said, working to be able to protect the, the health of the workers. But we also have to keep these facilities open because it's what feeds our state and our nation. Dr. Marcellin. Uh, several experts from UNMC have been touring the packing plants in the last week or two, evaluating them, working with them on best practices. What do you think are the best practices for someone in that kind of work environment to keep from spreading a virus? And what would you recommend to the plants to do to mitigate that? So that's a good question, and I think you can approach it from a number of different ways. The first is more of a systems approach to it, where you're looking at what are the policies that can be put in place at the meatpacking plant. And so uh, from an administrative standpoint, making sure that there is uh, leave available for people who may be sick, making sure that um, the individuals who are coming into work have appropriate PPE when they need it and are able to maintain uh, good physical distancing uh, regardless. And if they are definitely, if they are not able to maintain good physical distancing between individuals, really assuring that they have masks that are available, that there is good disinfection of uh, surfaces, and that there are um, hand sanitizers and uh, washroom areas that are, people are able to go wash their hands. And then um, also looking at how can people people as individuals be able to assess for what their risk might be and so the the institution or organization having a good relationship with those individuals to um, make it so that they can come to them if they are not well if they if someone at home is not well uh, what are the policies that are in place so that those people can feel like they can uh, maybe stay home safely but their jobs may not be in danger if they do because I think one of the issues uh, that we want to make sure that we consider is whether or not people feel like it's okay for them to stay home if they are sick uh, and not going to work while they're sick because they're concerned about their job and so that's you know that interface between the workers as well as the people who are creating the policies. Doctor, when you look at the Tyson plant in Dakota County, they, they're going to shut down temporarily over the weekend for what they're calling a, a deep clean. 
looking at this virus, is that going to prevent the virus from spreading long term or is that simply a short term solution? So it, it's more of a short term solution. We know that the virus itself can be available on, it can be, it remain on surfaces for several days. Uh, and uh, even some of the work that has been done at, at UNMC and at other institutions has seen that outside of the area generally where a, a person may have uh, coronavirus, they um, they may find particles, viral particles, on multiple different types of surfaces. And so really doing a deep clean will ensure that before people come back into the plant, then they're going to um, have uh, reduced the amount of a virus burden that is in that area. But it does not do anything to address the community spread and where the individual workers at the plant may actually pick up the virus and bring it in. And so it still needs to be coupled with additional um, activities such as providing the appropriate masking and making sure that we have hand sanitizers available, soap and water available for washing hands when people eventually do come back. And I'd also like to point out that UNMC and the Global Health Center actually published a um, meat processors uh, COVID-19 playbook to be able to distribute to the industry that is not only being used here in Nebraska but in other states as well because of the expertise of the folks that, and their experiences and learning by doing these tours. And what are you hearing about those tours specifically? Uh, you know, we've heard some good things that, that things are going well, but I mean, what, what are you really hearing from those people who've been in the plants? Yeah, so when I talked to Dr. Lawler or Shelley about some of the tours, I would say they've characterized it. They've been impressed with some of the steps that the pro meat processors have taken, but there's room for improvement. So, uh, for example, some of the things that they've talked about, some of the plants specifically about doing is looking at their air handling systems. I think you mentioned sanitizer, put having more hand sanitizer stations, uh, moving out, uh, again, thinking about moving people out where they're doffing and donning their PPE before they come in. So I think there's been things that they can improve upon, and that's part of what we're doing here. Like I said, this is, this is not supposed to be a uh, threatening thing that when they come in, it's really about trying to do, establish best practices in all these plants. It's not a competitive thing, right? This is something everybody should be doing. And that's what we're trying to, to really reinforce with all the processors, like, hey, these are best practices. You all should be adopting these. We got a question, Governor, from Kitty in Fremont. Uh, she says, my concerns are about the safety and health of meat processing plant employees in Nebraska, CDC and OSHA websites list comprehensive guidelines. Are these optional or mandated? Has Governor Ricketts or his staff talked directly with any employees who work at large meat processing plants to hear their concerns? And how can employees in Nebraska be confident their safety and health is being adequately safeguarded at work? Yeah, so uh, first of all, let's take the, the first one with regard to the CDC guidelines. Actually, I would say that what uh, UNMC has done is probably more extensive than the, U the CDC guidelines with regard to kind of best practices because it also involves what Dr. Marcellin was talking about is like reaching in not just at work but also doing education outside of work to be able to help people do that social distancing and so forth. So, um, you know, I think that actually what we're trying to accomplish here in Nebraska is more extensive than what CDC is doing. Uh, OSHA, that's a federal regulatory organization. so. I'm going to go ahead and defer on that because that really, we don't have anything to do with OSHA, so that they've got their own inspectors and they're their own program. And then, um, I'm sorry, the second part of the question was... Oh, you're going to test my memory. <laughs> yeah, so, I uh, lost in that one. Uh, employees in Nebraska be confident their safety and health is being adequately safeguarded. At yeah, so, so again, that's again, just part of what we want to do with these best practices is make sure that those, those plants are implementing those sorts of things so that people know that when they're coming in, they're being treated the right way. I think part of it is what we talked about with the administrative stuff, that people know that they can, they can be sick and they're not gonna be docked pay. I know that the plants, for example, have an attendance system. They've just you know, put that on hold. You're not gonna be penalized if you're not there. The short-term disability, paying people to stay home, that sort of thing, are part of what the plants are doing to be able to make sure that if you're sick, you're staying home. And that's one of the key messages we've had for them is, hey, look, you gotta make sure that if they're sick, they're staying home, and if anybody in their household is sick, everybody in the household is staying home as part of how we s slow the spread of this virus. Director Wellman, some questions kind of on the other side of the coin here. Uh, this one comes from Mary and Kennard. 
Prices for live cattle at Nebraska sale barns have plummeted, leaving Nebraska beef producers unable to earn enough money to pay scheduled payments on equipment and other purchases. What's being done in Nebraska to provide immediate support for the beef producer? I want to mention that uh, Rick also asked a question. Uh, the packers are making generous profits on cattle while the rancher is suffering from barely meeting the cost of production. How can this be remi rem remedied? remedied? And then yet another question on, are there any laws in place that, have been, that aren't being enforced when it comes to profits being seen by the packers versus what they are buying the cattle for from the feeder? Sure, so uh, yeah, there's a lot into that question, right, on the economics of, of the, uh, what the farmers and ranchers, ranchers are receiving and, and what the, uh, the packing industry is, is uh, selling the product for. But we also have the next step after the packer. We have the, uh, the, the retail part. So there's another price point between the packers and the retail point before it gets to the consumer. But in general, uh, yeah, I, I understand the pricing situation. Uh, there is, USDA has uh, started an investigation into the pricing scenario, especially on beef. Uh, we've been in on a few of those discussions with uh, USDA. I know our, our national state senators are involved with that. Some attorney generals are looking into it also. So I think, uh, and there is work being done on, on investigating the pricing and, and how that's working from, from when the packers are buying the uh, livestock from the farmers and how it's getting priced on through the, to the consumers. Uh, you know, the, the cash market that we have going on here, it's, sometimes it's, it's really, uh, right now, it's, it's the matter of they don't have the marketplace for the, for the end product. So that is reflected in what they're will bid on the cash market for the for the beef for the pork so uh, we're aware of that it, it's uh, it's a tough question we, we hope that USDA will will come through with this investigation and we'll see what comes out of that uh, but it's being looked into and and I, I emphasize or have empathy for the producers because you know I, I raise a few cattle too and I don't have any ready for market right now but and the ones that I will have are going to a private sale uh, to straight to the consumer so uh, yeah, it's we'll, when, when it'll be worked on, and we and I think there's more of a, a more of a push to for individuals to sell to the direct to the consumer too to help uh, get more of that dollar to the producer. And just in retrospect, I think we could probably think back and it's that we believe that the farmer doesn't get enough of the food dollar for a long time, has not received enough of the food dollar for a long time. So. Uh, can, work continues to, to help improve that, but it's probably not going to be quick enough to to really respond quickly to the situation we have here. Do you want to, do you want to talk about USDA's $19 billion program they've got going? Sure. We can talk about the, uh, the USDA direct payments that will be coming uh, maybe in May. There's still, there's been some, some uh, details on, on the USDA programs, but there's still a lot of questions out there. But basically the USDA has $16 billion allocated for direct payments to producers. And about 60% of that, just uh, 9.6 billion, so it's $9.6 billion is for livestock, hogs, cattle, dairy. And, and then 3.6 billion is for the, uh, the grains and, and, and that sector. So o overall, $16 billion of direct payments to producers. But to really, to put that into perspective, if we look at the state of Nebraska alone, in one year, we have $21.1 billion of cash receipts of agricultural products that comes to the state. It's about 20% of our state's revenue in one year. And this, the number, the $21.1 billion is from 2018. So that's Nebraska. We have probably have seen about a $4 billion hit right now so far to uh, Nebraska agriculture. It's predicted to be $4 billion. So when you're looking at countrywide, $16 billion that's available from USDA, we're looking at a $4 billion damage here just in the state of Nebraska already. Uh, that's $16 billion, even though it's a big number, it's not going to last to cover everybody as well as we would like them. There are other efforts being, uh, being talked about yet, too, for additional funding from that. I know the USDA actually asked for a $50 billion cap on their budget. They didn't get that. They got, uh, it was left at the same level it's been since 1987, I believe. So. Um, so they're they're working on that. There has been money allocated. It's 
lot, It'll lot of be farmers, a while yeah. A lot of farmers suffering, so yeah, yes. we'll, we'll keep watching that. Uh, Governor Ricketts, let's talk about opening the state. Uh, you have announced plans for parts of the state to partially reopen after several weeks of social distancing measures. 59 counties will have relaxed sanctions starting on May 4th. Another 10 counties will get the same looser restrictions on May 11th. We've heard from dozens of Nebraskans this week who are worried it's too soon to start reopening the state. Tyler from Guide Rock sent us this video. Good evening. My name is Tyler Strobel and I'm a master's student studying public policy at Duke University, originally from Guide Rock, Nebraska. Here at Duke, our professors stress the fact that data and scientific evidence are critical to making public policy decisions. According to current health data, Nebraska is one of a few states where the coronavirus is spreading at an increasing rate. Projections from the University of Washington suggest that the death rate in Nebraska will be worse than that of North Carolina. This is in part due to the fact that the governor of North Carolina instituted a quick and broad stay at home order. While there may be economic arguments for and against these decisions, the University of Nebraska Medical Center asserts the fact that vulnerable populations, such as the elderly, people with disabilities, and minority groups, will be disproportionately affected by the negative impacts of COVID-19. Given this, what specific scientific evidence do you cite in your decision not to pursue a stay-at-home order and plan to open up the economy at this time? Thank you. So, Governor, you've said all along that the goal is to not overwhelm the health care system and say that we've accomplished that. But as cases rise more and more rapidly, what makes you confident that we won't overwhelm the system by opening up too soon, yeah. maybe? So, because uh, we're using data. That's exactly the point. So Tyler's exactly right. We want to use data, make database decisions. So let's go back a couple of months in time. All the public health experts around the nation said, hey, you're going to have this pandemic. You, nobody's got any immunity to it. So you can't change the, the area under the curve, so to speak, just as many people are going to get infected. But what you can do is you can flatten that curve so that you don't have the big peak and you don't overwhelm your healthcare system. And so we put into place social distancing measures and all the directed health measures and everything else we've done, the 10 person rule, the six foot distance, uh, all the restrictions we've done on businesses and so forth. And we've been successful. That curve has been spread out, it's been slowed down. And nowhere have we endangered our healthcare system. Uh, in places where we've had, you know, the hot spots we've talked about, like Hall County, where we've been able to manage that. And you look at the hospital system today, it's actually pretty much stabilized. In fact, they've got fewer patients uh, that have coronavirus that are on ventilators today than they did even a week or two ago. So we've been able to manage the hot spots to be able to make sure everybody who shows up to the hospital gets that hospital bed, that ICU bed, or that ventilator. And that really is what two months ago all the public health experts said that should be your goal. That's what this is all about. You can't change, stop people from getting infected because nobody's got immunity, but you can make sure everybody gets that, that health care. So we've done that. And as we've seen it, we've been able to be able to manage it. And if you look at, say, just pick the Omaha area, for example, and you look at a hospital system that has got about 40% of the beds that are available, if you look at the ventilators, because that seems to be one of the key things that people who get coronavirus are going to need, we've got 348 ventilators, 99 of them being used, only 16 of them being used by coronavirus patients. That's a system that's got lots of capacity in it. And so as we look at the data for how many people are getting infected, what those rates are, how many people that get infected actually go to the hospital, how many people actually that go to the hospital will need that ventilator, we've got lots of capacity in our hospital system to be able to make sure that we can start loosening things up. And one of the analogies that I gave is, you know, look, think about the interstate. We could reduce the speed limit on the interstate to five miles an hour and we would end just about all traffic deaths. But we don't do that. What we're trying to do is we've, in a sense, taken the economy down to that five miles an hour. And now we're trying to take that back up and find what is that right speed. And that's what we're working on right now. So we're going to do it a little bit at a time. So, for example, through the month of, the month of May, we will still be at the 10-person rule that President uh, Trump put in place March 16th. So we'll have done that for a full 10 weeks, which, by the way, is two weeks longer than when we were talking to folks about how long some of these things would have to last. So we're going to be at that 10-person rule all through May. We're going to continue to focus on our six rules to keep Nebraska healthy, you know, the, the whole, you know, stay home, don't make any unnecessary trips, work from home or work in a socially distanced way, 
shop once a week, help kids, help seniors, exercise at home daily, that kind of thing. So we're gonna to continue to emphasize those six rules through the month of May, but that will allow us to be able to do some things like allow for elective surgeries, allow dining uh, restaurants to have dine-in up to 50% of their capacity and restrictions like staff wearing face masks and so forth. And some of the other things that we're gonna loosen up like allowing worship services, again, in a socially distanced way with restrictions. So all those things will start gradually opening up. And then again, what we're gonna do is watch the data. See what happens as far as like the number of cases and, and so forth. And again, if you look at a lot of our data and especially we work with UNMC and Dr. Gold has helped put together some models, you'll see that the, the, where we are with regard to a lot of this data is that it is, you know, we certainly have hot spots and we still have to continue to manage those, but by and large, a lot of it is flattening out across the state. And like I said, we've got lots of capacity to be able to make sure we can manage anybody who needs that hospital bed, that ICU bed, or that ventilator. Dr. Marcellin, uh, what concerns, if any, do you have about uh, any kind of loosening of restrictions at this point? So I think there's, there are a few uh, concerns, um, mostly related to what are people going to do when they start going back out into businesses and into the community? Are people going to uh, not uh, continue their physical distancing approaches? And I, I think the, if, the, if the state is going to go back to reopening, people still need to recognize that this is not a light switch that you jump and turn on and everything goes back to prior to January. 2020. Uh, people still need to recognize that when they go to the grocery stores, or when they go uh, to the barbershop, if they go, that they wear their mask they, when they go out, that they try to maintain at least a six foot <coughs> distance and not crowd around in areas. I think my biggest concern is people forgetting that and, and sort of just brushing back into, okay, things are back open. And um, relieving themselves of these good measures that we have already put into place that seem to be working. Uh, the other concerns uh, would be, you know, again, thinking about our essential workers and uh, what, is, what is the risk to them if the larger population and community goes back in and foregoes some of these uh, directed health measures and, and physical distancing, what is the risk to our essential workers, um, many of whom are minority populations that are disproportionately affected? And are we going to see a rise in cases in those communities as well? Because um, as, a, as a general community, we are starting to forget some of this social distancing. So I, I think the, the important message as things move towards uh, opening up is that people should still have a, a cloth mask available. They should still wear it when they go out in public. They should still wash their hands uh, frequently, not touch their face. They should still maintain safe distance from others. They should still avoid large gatherings, even if businesses are being opened. And along those lines and talking about businesses, Governor, although restrictions in parts of the state are being loosened, some businesses may choose to stay closed, but it's a tough balance for small business owners. Allison sent us this question. Hi, my name is Allison and I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. I recently opened up a hair salon in September and I absolutely love what I do and I love working with people. But I can honestly say for the first time in 13 years of my profession, I am scared to go back to work. What would you say to someone like me that financially has to go back to work but is scared to infect other people, including themselves? The necessary items like hand sanitizer, disinfectant, and masks are hard to come by, let alone for a business that needs large quantities of it. So, Governor, what advice do you have for business owners like Allison? Well, I think Allison's exactly right. If you're going to be a business that's going to be opening up, you've got to do the planning to make sure that you can do um, the appropriate things to keep your people safe and also your customers safe. So for example, with the salons, as that gets opened up, one of the requirements is that both the customer and the stylist is gonna to have to be masked. So as that small business, you're gonna to have to go out and figure out how can I get a hold of those masks. Now, that means that you're either gonna be having to 
work with a local vendor or seeing what you can do with regard to online and start establishing those things. But you know, you also, for example, have people like University of Nebraska, uh, they've got a collaborative there that's making hand sanitizer. They made something like 20,000 gallons of that and they're distributing that to about 100 organizations right now. So maybe there's an opportunity to be able to work with that to be able to get a hold of some of these supplies that uh, are more challenging to get you know, from different sources. So it is going to be work for these small business owners to be able to acquire the things they're going to need to be able to open safely. Uh, and that is going to have to be part of the choice that they're going to have to make, whether they're going to reopen or not, is have they got that material to be able to make sure they can do it in a safe way. So, uh, you know, obviously there's other programs out there to be able to help those small businesses like the Paycheck Protection Program, so that's the small business loan that Nebraska actually was number one in covering payroll with that. So that program has been refunded, so that might be another option for Allison to be able to go out and get one of those loans to extend how long she's not open, right? Uh, or to be able to figure out, you know, if there's a way, I mean, actually she'd have to be open to help pay people, but she doesn't actually have to be physically open, she'd just be paying people, that'd be a way to to help manage that. And then of course, with the pandemic unemployment assistance, there might be some options there for her as well. Traditionally, she would not be covered, but she would be covered under the pandemic unemployment assistance. So again, we're taking a very broad view of what it means to be impacted by the coronavirus in our Department of Labor. So that's another opportunity for Allison, specifically if she, she doesn't want to open up, to look into that to see if that could be something that could help her as well. Uh, we want to remind you, you're watching a special episode of Speaking of Nebraska with Governor Pete Ricketts, also Infectious Disease Specialist Dr. Jasmine Marcellin, and State Agriculture Director Steve Wellman. Give us a call, 800-676-5446 or 402-472-1212. You can also send us questions on social media. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at NET News Nebraska. Another question comes in from Christine in Hyannis. With the number of cases increasing in the state and restrictions being eased next week, will you consider any of these eased restrictions if cases continue to rise? I work in a long-term care facility. I'm concerned that reopening too soon will cost vulnerable residents in the state their lives. So a, a couple things with regard to that. So the cases are kind of a, an indicator of what is going on in the state. But again, I want to get us focused back again on the healthcare system because that's the thing we can actually measure that's tangible and real with regard to how is the virus impacting our communities. So I think that's one of the things we want to get back to is as we do more testing, guess what? we're gonna have more cases test positive, right? And that's what we've seen. We've increased testing and we've got more cases testing positive. Now that's not the only reason we've got more cases testing positive, but that's also one of the things that is part of that overall program. As we ramp up things like Test Nebraska, and you know, we want people to sign up at testnebraska.com, and we, do, we move from doing, say, 1,000 to 1,200 tests a day to an additional 3,000 tests a day, we will have more cases test positive. Now, getting back to the long-term care, though, in that case, what, those folks are going to have to continue to remain isolated for a while. And I don't know how long that's going to be, but really, and Dr. Marcellin, you can jump in here. Do we get a vaccine? Right? Because they're going to be a vulnerable population. So we've got to take other steps with regard to how we protect our long-term care facilities. And of course, we talked about Shelly and Dr. Lauer going out to visit these uh, meat processing plants, but they're also going to long-term care facilities to do the same types of steps with regard to how they can improve their operations to protect their residents. And there are other things that we do with the state with regard to making sure that uh, you know we step in if people are starting to test positive. Do we need to move residents? Are they able to isolate the residents effectively? So there's other things we're going to have to do with regard to those long-term care facilities. But again, that's going to be something that we're going to have to do on an ongoing basis, and at least until we get a vaccine, because those folks will continue to be a high-risk group given age and underlying health care conditions. Dr. Marcellin, uh, we got a question from uh, an anonymous uh, viewer. It says, if everyone wore a, fa a fabric or surgical mask in public settings, would the chance of COVID-19 transmissions be reduced to zero? What is the transmission rate between two people wearing fabric or surgical masks and talking while standing, say, a couple of feet apart? So that's a really good question. The masks for the community wearing them uh, is, there are a number of reasons why we recommend wearing them. The first is to prevent transmission between two individuals. Basically, it's essentially holding your, your secretions to yourself and keeping them to yourself and not sharing them with others. Uh, the, the masks themselves are not um, 
completely able to prevent an individual from inhaling and, and becoming infected with the COVID-19. Uh, the type of mask that would do that would be an N95 mask, not a uh, cloth mask or even a, a regular surgical mask. And so the, the purpose is to reduce the opportunity for those large droplets to be transmitted from one person to another. If two individuals are standing six feet apart from each other while wearing masks, the likelihood of them, uh, either of them transmitting the virus between each other is lower, but it's not zero. Um, and it is important for it to still, for us to still do that in a community because we are social beings by nature and we wanna be outside, we wanna be with everybody um, and we know specifically that the virus is transmitted through those droplets. And if we can reduce the opportunity for those droplets to go from one person to another with those masks, then that's the right thing to do. The thing that will, so I don't know if we're going to be able to reduce the, the virus to zero in the community at all, uh, honestly. At this point, I think it's premature to uh, try to figure that out. It may become a circulating virus like one of the other coronaviruses, like influenza virus, or we may be able to uh, develop a vaccine and vaccinate everybody and um, hopefully it's a long lasting vaccine that will provide lifelong immunity like some of the other vaccines that we have, or it could be a vaccine like influenza that we need to do every year. And so we just don't have that information right now. And um, so while we can, con what we can continue to do right now is continuing this, the physical distancing and wearing the mask because that's the thing that is going to help us to at least protect the people that are around us. So, Governor, we have phone calls tonight from Bob from Omaha, Greg from Grand Island, and Wendy from Panama, all basically asking, why not mandate that people wear masks, at least especially in the hot spot communities? Well, certainly we recommend, as Dr. Marcel was saying, if you're going out in public, wearing a mask is a, a great step to take. And it's one of the things that can help spread the, the virus. But there's lots of things that can do that. So we focus on some of those other things in my six rules with regard to staying at home, staying six feet away from people, shopping once a week. So we certainly recommend that as part of it, but we've also focused on other things that we think will be effective as well when we're doing our communications out there. And as far as mandating it, again, here's part of the problem, and this was another thing we talked about several months ago. When you put these restrictions in place and if you, here's the thing, and they work, people don't see anything happen, right? And in many of our counties across the states that we have, you know, we just had, a, a, you know, the woman calling from Hyannis. We had one case test positive in the Panhandle today. So I think we got a total of 46 cases there throughout the last two months. So when people see that, and when these social distancing work, they start saying, well, this was nothing. And then people start breaking your bands. So the more that you get restrictive, the less tolerance people are gonna have for following those rules so what we've done is tried to balance that off off to find those rules that we can ask people to do because we don't have enough police to go out and enforce these things everywhere, right? So we need, really need voluntary compliance. And that's what we've done. And Nebraskans have been great about it. We've asked for their compliance on these things. They've done a great job. And we need to continue to do that. But we need that voluntary compliance. And that's why if you get too heavy handed with these things, you run the risk of people are just going to say, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And while we're talking about masks, I, I wanted to point out that, you know, people might be thinking, well, you guys are all sitting there and you're not wearing masks. And um, one, of the, one of the important things when you have situations like this or meetings is making sure that individuals are six feet apart at least. And so the way that the studio is set up is that we've made sure that we have that distance in between speakers. And you know, I walked in here into the studio with my mask on and we have our, um, our personnel and our crew who are doing the the lights and the cameras and they're all wearing masks and so it, you know it's important to continue those measures wherever you can uh, so that we can all play our part in helping out with this.
Very good point. Uh, Director Wellman, let's talk ethanol. A couple of questions. Ethanol plants are closing. This uh, comes from an anonymous viewer. Uh, ethanol plants are closing. Where is the support for ethanol plant production? We have bins full of corn and no operating ethanol plant to market our grain. And then Harold also uh, calls in and says, is there an effort to use Nebraska ethanol to get hand sanitizer to the grocery stores? Stores in my area haven't seen sanitizer on the shelves since this got going. So to the last question, yes, there is an effort to get uh, sanitizer, hand sanitizer from ethanol to the grocery stores. And that's part of the effort that the Governor Rick has just talked about with the University of Nebraska. They have great partners from uh, ethanol producers throughout the state. Uh, supplying the ethanol for that, the University at Innovation Campus, they're, they're creating this hand sanitizer and they are uh, donating it to, um, to multiple agencies. So I think there the question is, um, you know, if somebody's in need, they can either they can reach out to the Department of Agriculture. We can get them in touch with uh, with those people making those products and, and maybe help them out. And, and to that point, also we're uh, we've been in touch with Kathy Sifkin with the with the Nebraska Grocers Industry Association multiple times and and working with her to get hand sanitizers and PPE for uh, the grocery store owners. Um, I know we, we've made phone calls to get uh, volunteers to make masks for their local grocery stores in, in the towns across Nebraska. Uh, so, so some of that is going on. Now to the ethanol industry, the, you know, Nebraska is the second largest ethanol producer in the United States. We have 25 plants across the state. Less than half of those are producing ethanol at this point in time. And the ones that are still producing ethanol are at a reduced rate uh, under capacity. The uh, the corn market certainly has seen the damage from that. Uh, corn prices have probably dropped a, at least a dollar a bushel since uh, since this started. And when I mentioned earlier that Nebraska is projected to have a four billion dollar damage from COVID-19, half of that is in, is the ethanol sector itself, so about two billion dollars. And that's just the ethanol part. And then we have the damage to the corn growers and and the loss of income, loss of value for their product uh, from the uh, from. From the support side, that ethanol is one sector that's been left out so far of the USDA support, and and we're working with uh, with our my fellow directors of agriculture throughout the United States. We have a, a, an association, and we have weekly phone calls uh, focused on on all of our response to COVID-19 and and the the point that ethanol is not supported by any of these. Uh, a disaster programs yet to this point is, is something that we are very much aware of and working on to, uh, to see what we can do to be helpful in that manner. And in fact, I've also had uh, been on the phone with Secretary Perdue talking about this specific thing with regard to ethanol and the lack of support for this from a variety of things. Asking, uh, you know, what are some of the other things USDA can do? Can we do things with EPA? Are there things we can do to get some relief to the ethanol industry? But I think to, to this point so far, Director Wellman is accurate in that we, we haven't seen that support come from Washington, D.C. Governor, we've got a couple of questions, one from Shannon and Gretna and the other from Danny and Lincoln, basically saying that you're allowing restaurants to open in some areas at 50 percent capacity, but not specifically bars. And, and when are you going to allow bars to open? So, again, this is part of what we're doing to try and walk that line and have that balance between opening up and making sure that we don't allow for the spread more. And so what we've said is we're going to allow restaurants to be able to open up at 50 percent capacity. We're going to allow bars to continue to sell package and sell, you know, and do delivery and things like that. But we're not going to allow bars to open at this point. And we're not going to allow, for example, bar seating at restaurants. Uh, you'll only be able to consume alcohol at a restaurant if you're also consuming a meal. So we have put some restrictions on how this is all going to work. And I, I, again, I'm, I, I'm sorry for the bar owners who are going to be, um, you know, really hit hard by this. But it's again part of that taking a step by step approach of opening things up to make sure that we again don't overwhelm that health care system. Dr. Marcel, on a very specific question from Kathleen in Albion, uh, we're elderly wondering how long this virus lasts on newspapers and the mail. So good question. Um, we have information about the virus lasting on uh, hard surfaces. And so the, based on the data that's available, you can expect it to last on those sort of hard surfaces for up to up to 72 hours. Um, and, and you're uh, talking like plastic, metal, wood, that kind yes, of thing? Yes, plastic, you know, hard, harder surfaces. So pa something like paper um, would be expected uh, to last 
on there for hours, but exactly how long, uh, hard to tell. So um, people ask whether or not they should wipe down their mail when they get their mail uh, from, from the mailman or mailwoman. Um, there's uh, no problem with doing that. There's no harm in, in wiping down the mail. It's uh, un unlike unlikely that you will uh, develop the uh, COVID-19 if you pay attention to washing your own hands and not touching your face after you handle the mail. I think that is the more important aspect of understanding what to do with you know, delivered items um, rather than focusing on the item itself, but what do you do with your hands and your face? Because that is the only way that the virus can actually get into your body is through your mucous membranes, your eyes, your mouth, your nose, if you touch your face without washing your hands. So another question along that line from Nancy, can the COVID-19 virus be transmitted through the air ducts in a contaminated hospital room to a clean and sanitized room? Is it safe to deliver a newborn in a hospital that treats COVID-19 patients? So uh, we right now, we don't have any evidence. That question is asking about whether or not the virus is airborne in the sense of uh, putting it into context of other other infections that we have, like measles, like chickenpox, like tuberculosis. Um, we do not have evidence that shows that the virus travels in that way. It travels through large droplets. And while there is data that has shown that the virus can remain suspended uh, in the air for some time afterwards, the, the work that has been done at UNMC actually did not show um, live a virus that can infect people uh, that remains uh, in those surfaces. And so I would not expect at this point, based on the data that we have, that a virus would go from one room where a person has COVID-19 through an air duct and into the other room. Uh, and so that's not something that I would be concerned about right now based on the data that we have. And as far as uh, giving birth in a hospital, um, I think we absolutely will make sure that the people who are who are in a hospital who have COVID-19 are um, being isolated and that individuals taking care of them are using the appropriate um, protective equipment. And generally speaking, those are not the same individuals that are going to be taking care of uh, newborns. And um, I, so I do think that it is safe for newborns, um, for people to give birth in hospitals where there are also COVID units, just because the infection control procedures and policies that are put into <coughs> place to make sure that the virus stays there uh, are very stringent, uh, and uh, that makes the rest of the hospital a very safe place. Governor Pat from Omaha, question about testing. If a person's health conditions and symptoms change for better or worse after they've completed the testnebraska.com assessment, are we in Nebraska to fill out another assessment like Governor Reynolds of Iowa has told Iowans to do as many times as needed, or are we in Nebraska only to update any health changes if we get an email to set up the testing, as she says she heard that you said? If the latter, aren't we potentially missing out on data needed to identify new clusters and places to set up more testing? Yeah, so I would recommend that if you've got, if you're symptomatic and you've got a change in that symptomatic, that you should contact your healthcare provider right away and make sure that if you know, there's things that the healthcare provider wants you to do, you do that. So the first thing is take care of your own health. So uh, you will be given an opportunity when we uh, you know, reach out to schedule an appointment to update that, that health data that we collected the first time around. So uh, we can certainly take a look at maybe allowing people to do it more often. But I think right now that if you do have a change in those symptoms, the best thing to do is you know, worry about your health, contact your healthcare provider, and if you need to get a test from your healthcare provider, they can do the test right then and there. And we can worry about the test Nebraska stuff later. And, and again, there's nothing that says you won't still be called in to be able to do that test at some you know, later point as well. So I'd say first thing though is if your symptoms change, go see your healthcare provider. Director Wellman, what are farmers markets going to look like? How are they gonna change? Well, that's a good question. We've had some discussions about that. And, and one of the things with Department of Agriculture is we're involved in a lot of this stuff and as a service oriented and a mediator between between parties. But but uh, like farmer markets, for example, we, we don't conduct any farmer markets ourselves. It's usually up to the local communities and, and others that actually do conduct those markets. But, but we do work with the producers of the produce that, that uh, are vendors at these farmer markets. 
So from what I know, I've, I've seen that uh, some of the markets have delayed their opening. Uh, we issued guidance about two weeks ago, I believe it was, maybe a week ago, on, on farmer markets of, you know, get, give more space, expand your footprint, allow for more space in between vendors. Uh, there's protocol in there for the vendors themselves. There's protocols in there for the customers to protect themselves. Uh, you know, no samples given out, that type of thing. Uh, if you're going to purchase something, the vendor gives it uh, and puts it into a package for you and you take it that way. And then also for the for the people organizing the farmers markets, uh, put some tape down, put some direction, have different people, uh, have additional staff out there to help the flow of people. Uh, make sure they have hand sanitizers or hand wash stations available for the vendors and for the customers. Uh, in the meantime, we've, we've, my team's reached out to all the uh, produce uh, producers that we have in Nebraska, that uh, at least a good portion of them, to see what they're planning to do. Um, from our indication is most of them are planning to plant uh, normally what they, what they normally plant. Some of them are uh, somewhat concerned about the delay in the opening of the farm markets. I think they've reached out to some of their dir customers directly and to try to uh, sell those products uh, direct to them. Another effort that we've done with the Department of Agriculture is I've reached out to the two major food banks in Nebraska and, and said, you know, what happens if we have produce coming to the marketplace here and they don't have the farmer markets to go to or they don't have the direct consumers to sell to, will you be able to, uh, to, to utilize this product? And so we're working on that to get that set up. So, uh, and, and they've been very responsive to the, saying yes, they would, they would be very interested in getting some of that produce if it's available. Uh, the concern from the producers are they want to support their their long-term customers. They want to take care of their old customers and make sure they're getting product to them um, and balance that out with what they have extra and, and then go to food banks or other marketplaces after that. Governor, I want to ask you about unemployment because we've gotten a number of questions again about unemployment. Uh, for Brian in Omaha, it's been five weeks that he's been waiting. Katie and Benson, six weeks. Amanda, five weeks. And and this from a viewer in Omaha, for many Nebraskans, rent is due on Friday. What do you have to say to those who have yet to receive their unemployment benefits? Some have been waiting since April 1st. So with regard to the unemployment benefits, I want to put in context here, we've received as many claims in the last two months as the previous three years combined. We've paid out, I think, the previous two years combined. So we have seen just a huge volume impact, and we've increased the staff from about 34 to 166. But having said that, uh, we've, we've also said, I've told uh, John Albin, our commissioner of uh, labor, who has been on the show, hey, what are other things we can do to be able to improve the system? You know, we're all about continuous improvement and about stealing other people's good ideas. And so today what we announced was that we are, I issued an executive order that will adjust previous executive orders to be able to uh, allow us to, sm to make the process flow a little bit better. And specifically what it does is, State statute 48626 uh, says that we have to go back and check everybody's employment for the time period to verify that they actually, uh, you know, were didn't leave in a voluntary way to be able to collect the benefits. So I is a waive that statute. So all we're going to do now is instead of going back and collect, looking at all those employers, just go to the last one. So especially when you got a lot of people in the restaurant industry, you had some people with five previous employers, sometimes 10, I think one person at least 20. So we'd have to go back and check, say, all five or 10 or 20 of those people. Well, guess what? Those employers aren't open right now. So that's difficult. So this is part of what's been slowing down this whole process for people who are eligible under the old unemployment system. So by waiving that, we expect that to make that process go a lot smoother. The other aspect, and that's why it's always challenging when people say, I've been waiting. Well. The Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program was passed, but we then had to develop the software to be able to process those claims because the existing system didn't work for it. That took about three weeks to get done. We started, uh, we got that uh, software done. We started processing those applications on Sunday. We started paying out on Monday. I think uh, through today, we paid out about $40 million of claims to 11,000 people. So, and people who are uh, only gonna be eligible under that Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, We'll start seeing their, their claims getting paid this week. So that process also will start moving along this week as well. But again, if you were not eligible under the traditional unemployment system, like say you were a, uh, a student working work release or you know, uh, you know, one of the, the work study programs, you wouldn't be eligible for the regular unemployment program and you'd only start getting paid once we got this software in place, which 
writing it in three weeks is pretty much record time for getting some of these things done. So we are taking steps to be able to process things, these things faster because we know families do have rent checks due. And uh, I think people are going to see over the next couple of weeks a, a vast improvement in how fast we're going to be able to get those processed. As our time winds down here a little bit, I want to get this question in from Michelle in Lincoln. She says, my kids ask this question daily, so I would ask the governor, I told him I'd ask the governor myself, is there a chance that my kids will be able to participate in organized sports this summer? So that's a great question, and maybe I'll dodge that and send it to Dr. Marcellin. No, I won't <laughs> do that to you. So definitely not in May, okay, so we're under the 10 person through May. Uh, and again, depending how May goes, we may see the ability to do more in June and maybe then more in July. So I would say probably the opportunity for organized games in June is probably not gonna be there. But again, a lot will depend on how it goes in May. So again, folks, uh, to Dr. Marcellin's point though, don't forget all the things we've just been doing for the last two months, right? We, we still want people to keep that six foot distance. We want you to avoid the 10 person groups for, you know, go to the grocery store, only shop once, don't take the whole family. All of our rules that we've talked about are still gonna be important in May to be able to make sure we continue to loosen up down the road. So if you want to be able to say play sports later this summer, then make sure you're practicing good social distancing now because that's the way we'll be able to do it. If you're continuing to do the right things now, you'll be able to play those sports later this summer. Also had questions, do you feel confident that school is going to open on time in the fall in Nebraska? So obviously the University of Nebraska says they're going to be operating with students and I know that Commissioner Bloomstead is working with his schools with regard to what that will look like for them as well. I do, it's going to be different, so there are going to be changes in place for how school operates in the fall, but I believe right now that Commissioner Bloomstead is working with his school districts to be able to make that work so that schools, uh, kids, schools will be operating with kids in the classroom next fall. Again, I, it's going to be different. It's not going to be the same old, you know, to Dr. Marcellin's point again, it's not going to be the way it was before. Are they Are going to be wearing masks? It, it'll be modified. Wearing masks could be one of the things they're doing. I mean, here, here's the thing about schools, right? It is the highest concentration of people we have in our society, and they're not particularly health conscious. So we're going to have to take additional steps, to, and maybe mask is it, to be able to make sure we are preventing the spread of virus. All right. Good conversation. Thank you all. That is all the time that we have for tonight. Thanks to Governor Pete Ricketts and Dr. Jasmine Marcellin, and also Director Steve Wellman, the Director of Agriculture in Nebraska, also to the NET crew working behind the scenes to bring this program to you. You can catch tonight's program online. Just go to netnebraska.org slash coronavirus, a number of resources for you there as well. And you can also send us your questions for next week's live town hall with Governor Ricketts. It'll be another special episode of Speaking in Nebraska. That's coming up next Thursday at 8.30 Central on NET, NET Radio, and streaming online. Until then, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again next week.